The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear a telephone conversation about booking a venue for... private event. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 8. This is George and Dragon. How may I help? Hi. I'm calling to inquire about your upstairs venue. I'm interested in booking it for a private event, and I was wondering if I could ask a few questions. Yes, of course. Just give me a second, please. So, before we start, could I please get a name and phone number? Yes. My name is Clara Carlton. Carly, um... Could you spell that for me, please? Sure. It's C-A-R-L-E-T-O-N. And the phone number? Well, I'm going to give you my work number as I'm booking the venue for a work event. Right. So it's 020-8322-1479. Great. So what would you like to know? Well... I saw on your website that the price can be from £20 per hour, so I would like to get an exact quote if possible. Well, the price depends on the type of event, the date and the number of people, and whether we will be providing food as well. Oh, it's for a retirement party for one of my colleagues. Okay, and for which date is that? Well, we were thinking next Tuesday, the 31st of May. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, but the venue's already booked that day. We're free on Monday and Wednesday, if that would suit you. Well, Wednesday's no good, because the gentleman who's retiring will be gone by then. But Monday works just as fine. Great. You'll get a cheaper rate for Monday, too. Excellent. And how many people will there be? Well, at the moment, it's supposed to be 16, but it might go up to 17. We're waiting for one of our co-workers to confirm whether they'll be available that night or not. The boardroom in the venue only has space for 15 people, I'm afraid. We've got enough standing room for about 15 extra people. Is that all right? Oh, I'm sure it will be fine. We won't be sitting down much anyway. Would it be possible to provide two extra chairs just in case, though? Yes, of course. Great. And finally, will you be needing us to provide food as well? Well, we'll be bringing the cake, but I imagine that yes, we will be ordering some food as well. What are your options for nibbles? Well, we've got quite a vast selection depending on which type of menu you're interested in. We've got meat-based tapas, as well as some vegetarian and vegan options, and we've also got some sharers. Well, as far as I know, none of us are vegans, so I don't think we'll be needing that. Some meat-based and vegetarian options would be great, though. Would you like me to talk you through them, or...? Well, you do have the menu online, right? Yeah, you can find it on our website. The only thing is that a couple of options have been removed and replaced with new ones, and we haven't had the chance to update it online yet. Okay. Let me just pull it up on my screen. Just a second. All right. So, in the meat-based food section, the dishes that have been discontinued are the mini fajitas and the pulled pork bruschetta. Oh, that's a shame. The pulled pork bruschetta looked really nice. Yeah, but we've replaced them with two new, really popular dishes. We've got a trio of sliders, which is three mini burgers, made one each with chicken, beef, and pulled pork. And we've also got ham and cheese croquettes. Oh, that sounds nice. So I'll have seven of the mini burgers then. I see you've also got vegetarian croquettes. Are they still in the menu? Yeah, we've got the vegetable croquette and the potato croquette. And how many croquettes are there in each dish? The vegetable one is five. The potato one is four. Okay, so I'll have... Two of the vegetable croquettes and 
I'll also have two of the ham and cheese ones, please. Great. Anything else? Well, I don't know. It all looks so nice. What would you recommend? Hmm. Well, what I would recommend is the simmered squid. It's slow cooked in wine and served with potatoes. I'd also recommend the hummus platters. Our chef actually makes his own hummus, and it's one of our most popular sharers. And, of course, all of our salads, especially the Caesar salad, we're famous for them. Right. So I'll go for five hummus platters, or should I get six? No, you know what? Five is just fine. I... I won't be having any of the squid. It sounds lovely, but I'm just not sure how popular it would be with my colleagues. Yeah, fair enough. And finally, one Caesar salad and one vegetarian, the goat's cheese one. Great. And just for the final question, for how many hours would you be booking the venue? Well... Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 9 and 10. This entire animated video is made with AI. Stick around and I'll show you how to create your own without any tech skills. One fateful night, she stumbles upon a peculiar letter addressed to her from the future. It presents a warning. Clara, heed this call. Now listen and answer questions 9 and 10. We'd be arriving straight after work, so somewhere around 7 p.m., and I'd expect we'd need it until at least 9 p.m., maybe even 10 p.m., so... So, three hours? Well, probably, but let's make it four just in case. Right, great. So, just give me a minute and I'll get back to you with a quote, all right? Yes, of course. Um, hi. So, I spoke to my manager, and the total with the food and a drink starter for 17 people would come up to 318 pounds and 95 pence. Okay. But he'd be happy to offer you a 5% discount, which would bring the total down to just 303 pounds. And that includes a pint of any beer, a glass of wine, or fizzy drink for each person. Okay. That sounds reasonable enough. Let's go for it. Right. So, I would just need a deposit of... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. You will hear the head teacher of a school giving a talk to parents about some new classrooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for making it along. 
I know how busy you all are with term coming to an end. As you know, the aim of this meeting is to show you the plans we've got to add two new classrooms and how that will affect the playground. Now, I've heard that quite a few of you are worried that there'll be hardly any playground left, but I want to reassure you that that's not the case at all. I think there's been quite a lot of uninformed talk going on, and people have started worrying unduly. I certainly hope I can dispel any of your concerns this evening. Firstly, I have a plan of what the school should look like, which I'll project onto the screen. The school governors and the developers want to hear your feedback before making final decisions. Your feedback's very important. When I've gone through the plan with you, you can ask questions and we'll discuss those queries in detail. There'll be plenty of time to tell us what you think over the coming weeks. And once the plans are a little more developed, they'll be available online. There'll be a weekly update. And once the actual construction begins, you'll be able to check progress as it happens. Personally, I'm very happy with where we've got to. I knew we had to have the extra space, but I must admit I worried long and hard about what we might have to sacrifice for it. The developers have certainly convinced me that we've made the right decision. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, can everyone see the plan now? Good. Let's start at the Balfour Road entrance, since that's where most of you come and go from. The Farley Road entrance and lower playground won't be affected at all. Now... As you come into the top playground, the two new classrooms will be on the right. There'll be a new gate and the steps down will be rebuilt. There'll be a ramp for disabled visitors too. On the plan here, only the parts of the building affected by the plans are shown. I'll explain why the hall is marked on later. So, as I said... The new classrooms will be to the right of the entrance and, as you can see, will take up very little of the playground space. We feel the Year 6 children need their own area away from the younger children. So, this one on the left of the two rooms will be the new Year 6 classroom. As you can see, there's no direct entrance from the playground. The plan is to include a small entrance area here from the playground for coats and boots and so on. Entrance to the classroom will be from that area. There will also be an additional entrance to the hall from this cloakroom so children will be able to get to the hall from two different directions from inside the main building and from the new entrance area. I hope that's clear. Now, as you all know, the hall doubles up as the cafeteria at lunchtime. One of the rumours I heard was that we're planning to dispense with the cafeteria and open up a snack bar. I can categorically state that replacing healthy school meals with a snack bar is not remotely in our thoughts. The other new classroom, 
that's the one with the playground entrance here, is going to be an exciting new venture for us. That's because its principal use will be for the preschool and after-school clubs. More and more parents want that facility outside school hours, and we need a dedicated space to run these activities. I think there were also worries about the nursery school, though I'm not really sure why, to be honest with you. I can tell you now that the whole area on the other side of the main school building will be totally unaffected. The nursery will continue operating as it does now. There will be a couple of smaller constructions, modernization work really, down here on the other side of the top playground. Cycling into school is getting more and more popular, so we're replacing the old bike sheds with a brand new bicycle bay. There'll be space for 60 bikes. The children's toilets will also be modernised and the children will be able to enter them from inside the school building rather than from the playground as they do now. There'll be brand new staff toilets in that part of the building too, I'm pleased to say. So, I hope that's at least started to allay a few fears. Take a few minutes to look at the plan that I'll get out of the way then I'll answer a few questions if you have any. Does that make sense to you? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. You will hear three students discussing the issue of waste deposited in space. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hey, did you manage to go to the talk by Dr. Chadwick this morning, Andy? I was there. What happened to you, Sam? My bike had a puncture. Mm. Seriously. Anyway, Ruth, I bet you took some notes. Can you fill me in? Sure. It was all about space junk. Really interesting, actually. I mean, I knew about how much rubbish humans are dumping here on planet Earth. But I had no idea how much junk there is flying around in space. Did you know that there are literally millions of pieces of rubbish orbiting the Earth as we speak? Not until now, I didn't. <laughs> they reckon that around a 100 tonnes of very small objects, like mainly dust, drops on Earth every single day. Yes, that's what she said. I thought space junk was all man-made. I can't believe they know so accurately how much is actually out there. Do they track and monitor it all the time? Yeah, they do. According to the talk, there are nearly 25,000 objects larger than 10 centimetres in diameter now orbiting the Earth. And what does all this space junk consist of? Isn't it all discarded parts of rockets that were either broken or left behind after space missions, like Apollo and all those spacecraft from years ago? Well, yes, but not only that... All other kinds of debris that we've dumped in space too. Anything from 
dead satellites to loose metal screws. There are even tiny particles of paint and liquid coolant. So who is to blame for depositing all this rubbish? Where does it come from? Well, I knew you were going to ask me that, Sam. So hang on, you can take some of my notes if you like. Thanks a lot. That's really helpful. Here, look. Over a third, thirty-seven percent to be exact, comes from Russia, but other countries are close behind. Another third. Well, just under actually, twenty nine percent is from America, and then twenty eight percent is from China. Yes, but other countries like India are adding to the rubbish pile, and don't forget the European Space Agency also has spacecraft in orbit. That's true. We're talking serious space junk here.、Mm, pretty serious, I'd say. So come on, what do you think are the chances of something solid dropping from space onto our heads? <laughs> Good question. Everyone asked that. Doctor Chadwick said at least one piece of junk falls to Earth every single day. But look at it this way: Earth is a pretty big place, so actually the statistical chances of being hit are extremely low. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the discussion, and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. So, are you saying I'm more likely to win the lottery? Well, just think about it. Two thirds of the Earth is ocean. <laughs> That's true, but in time, almost all these pieces of rubbish will fall to Earth because the object's orbit is decreased by its gravitational pull. But the good news is. That they don't cause any serious damage, you know they can't actually survive the heat generated on re-entry. They simply burn away. But that's not always the case. There are exceptions. Chunks of the United States UARS satellite recently fell into the Pacific Ocean. The UARS satellite. It was this six-ton satellite launched by the Space Shuttle Discovery way back in 1991. So it had been up in space for twenty years, but stopped working in two thousand and five. It weighed five thousand seven hundred kilos, and that's about the same as a double decker bus, apparently. And just check my notes. Here it is. Yes, the largest of these great big chunks that fell into the sea weighed about a hundred and fifty-eight kilograms. Think of the weight of an adult gorilla, Sam, and you get the picture. A nice soft landing, then. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Chadwick said, "Imagine a couple of washing machines tied together and travelling at a hundred miles per hour, and you'll get an idea." <laughs> oh, and do you remember Skylab? That was another U.S. space station, and it fell to Earth at least three decades ago in 1979. It fell into the Indian Ocean and the deserts of Western Australia. According to what I wrote down, that particular space junk weighed one hundred tons. And let's not forget Mir, the Russian space station. Mir weighed one hundred and thirty-five tons, far, far larger than UARS, and it fell to Earth in two thousand and one. It plunged straight into the South Pacific. All very interesting. Listen. I've got some junk of my own to sort out. My bike. That's the second puncture this week. <laughs> Come on, I'll help you fix it. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. We are going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently, depending upon whether we are very old, very young, or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things? And how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is, do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them, so how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile and a piece of string. It works like this. If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from 1 to 14 days later. If you look at this table of results, at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, if you train them on a variety of colours and designs, they will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as 21 months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random with little distinction between key events and trivial ones. And very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So, we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. Look at questions 36 to 40. Now answer questions 36 to 40. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organising their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? 
One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloguing system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do. In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this. A lecture, which they were listening to, was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage, and make the recall more demanding, this accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average 70%, and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed, but the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than 60%, and the six-year-olds could manage little better than 40% recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digit span is shown to vary enormously. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Game. It's a rage game.